Taking away days of screen time. Joe Holmes. I thought I thought you were talking about like future reviews. I just no. I'm really hoping it has changed because I have to try that. Please don't do it. So then they might come up. I was offering I want I know it's a bit more. I know it. It's like, damn it. Fans. Hello, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, welcome to the inaugural event of the Rethinking Korea Speaker Series. I'm Philip Tai, a director of the Global Asian Studies Program here at Northeastern University and associate professor of history and Asian studies. Now, before we begin, I just want to take a few moments during this inaugural event to say some words about the series and Korean studies here at Northeastern. The speaker series invites a number of distinguished scholars from different disciplines to provide fresh perspectives on Korea, Korea being a very critical region in the world today. The series is supported by the South Korea Initiative Fund, which was established earlier this year by a very generous donation from the Min family, uh, Ji and Soon Jin uh, Min. The Min family was very impressed um, by the experiential education their child was receiving here at Northeastern and they wanted to help create an institutional presence for Korean studies here at Northeastern. Now, besides this two-year speaker series, the South Korea Initiative Fund will offer financial support for Northeastern students who wish to study or work in uh, Korea. It will help support the hiring of a Korean language instructor, and it will support a scholarly symposium on Korea and the East Asia world. So we have a lot of programming, a lot of activities on Korea in the pipeline. But why? Why, why Korea? Um, well, I've been here at Northeastern for a decade now, exactly a decade. Um, and every semester, students always ask me, I'm really interested in Korea. Can I take a course on Korean language, Korean history, uh, Korean culture, Korean anything here at Northeastern? And invariably, I would disappoint them by saying, no, 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 sorry. Um, now, this enduring student interest in Korea is understandable. As many of you already know, um, South Korean cultural exports have circulated around the world, permeating many aspects of uh, global pop culture. Meanwhile, beyond the allure of South Korean pop culture, there are other markers of Korea's importance. The uh, South Korean economy is one of the world's largest and most dynamic. The South Korean technology sector, its public health infrastructure um, are among the world's best. And finally, the Korean Peninsula. The Korean Peninsula remains a flashpoint for geopolitical tensions more than 75 years after uh, the Korean War. So whatever perspective you take, Korea is important. Um, Korea matters. And in our contemporary world, you ignore it at your peril. The hunger from our students for all things Korea is very understandable. So this speaker series and the associated programs um, supported by the South Korea Initiative Fund will help satiate some of that student demand and curiosity. And I hope that this series and our associated programs will help make clear Korea's many connections um, to our world today and to the world tomorrow. And we hope they will kickstart some much needed long delayed conversation and education here at Northeastern about the importance of Korea. Now, before I introduce our speaker, let, please allow me a moment to acknowledge the many people and supporters who made this series possible. Um, I wanna thank once again, the Min family for their very generous donation. Um, I want to thank Michelle Davis at the University Advancement Office for securing this support. Um, I wanna thank my many colleagues here at Northeastern and the uh, Global Asian Studies Program, especially uh, Professors Doreen Lee and um, Professor Miu Chung, who has done and will continue to do um, so much work uh, behind the scenes. I want to thank our many co-sponsors, including the Departments of History, Philosophy and Religion, 
um, and International Affairs, as well as the Northeastern Humanities Center and the Center for the Arts. Finally, I want to acknowledge our wonderful staff who made this event possible, uh, Mika Morikawa Joe, Caitlin McPhee, um, and Tian Yao Yu. And with that, I will introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Yun Sung Yang is Associate Professor of Korean and Comparative Literature and of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Boston University. Her book, From Domestic Women to Sensitive Young Men, Translating the Individual in Early Colonial Korea, won the James B. Palace uh, Book Prize of the Association for Asian Studies in 2020. I can assure you that's a big deal. Um, and she is the editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Modern Korean Literature. Her second book project tentatively titled Trans-Pacific Palimpsests, Early 20th Century Korean Migrant Literature Between Two Empires has been supported by a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Fellowship and a Susie Newhouse Center for the Humanities um, Fellowship. Her talk today is entitled Cosmopolitanism, Korean Language Trans-Pacific Genre Fiction During the Interwar Period. Please join me in welcoming Professor Young. for the generous uh, introduction. Thank you everyone for coming to listen to me on such a beautiful Thursday afternoon. And I'm very grateful to Professor Dorian Lee and uh, Professor Philip Tai for inviting me to this amazing speaker series at Northeastern University. I also want to mention Kate McVee's world-class organization skills. This is by far the best organized event I've been I have been invited to in recent years. I was trained as a specialist in Korean literature and have been writing about and teaching Korean literature, film, culture for many years. For the last few years, and I, I've been spending a good portion of my time reading stories that do not seem to belong to. Connected to, I found. Do not seem to have a clear national belonging, especially those written by racial minorities around the world. I've been doing this since encountering an ethnic Korean author, Nak Chung Chan. He did not publish any of his works during his lifetime, including three novels, four short stories, and several essays, and some other incomplete pieces. Today's talk will focus on Chan's novella, A Righteous Robber, though I will also briefly mention his two other true stories. Before that, I will explain how I stumbled upon this project, and how, how I stumbled upon uh, Chan's manuscript, and briefly discuss his life. By the end of the talk, I hope to come across one idea. Reading unpolished, unedited, and messy stories like Tian's can tell us something non-equal national literature cannot. I propose to, propose to read Nak Chang Jun's archives as minor cosmopolitan literature, which I define, puts into question the borders between Korean literature, East Asian literature, Asian American literature, and American literature and envisions a world beyond racial, ethnic, national boundaries. A few years ago, my colleague Sun Young Park, a, a, a specialist in Korean literature at the University of Southern California asked me if I would be interested in reading a manuscript by an unknown first generation Korean American writer. Handwritten Korean language manuscripts were donated to the USC library in 2005, but remained untouched because the library staff could not find anyone who could read or translate them. They were written in a turn of the 20th century styles, which became outdated by the late 1910s in colonial Korea. Professor Park was looking for a few specialists who could assess the value of the archive. So she thought of me because I had just published the monograph, which was mentioned by Professor Tai, about the evolution of Korean fiction from this period. Honestly, though, I didn't find it immediately interesting. 
I had embarked on, um, I had just embarked on another project about madness and medicine and sexuality in Korean literature. I was pretty excited about that. Besides, I was re-editing 21st, 21 chapters for the Rutledge Handbook of Modern Korean Literature. There was a little room in my schedule to take on another, another project. So I said, maybe later, secretly hoping that she would notice my lack of enthusiasm and try to find someone else. <laughs> But she was adamant and quite consistent. A few days later, she called me again and asked me to join the AS panel that she, she was organizing over this archive. Mainly out of friendship rather than intellectual curiosity, I have hardly agreed to read one of the short stories by this unknown writer. Once I start, started reading the story, however, I was completely blown away. The next day, I found myself writing an abstract for the panel, and the abstract wrote itself. The next day, um, although quite, quite timely, one contributor to my uh, edited volume withdrew from the project at the last minute. I needed to find a replacement. I quickly turned my AAS panel into a chapter and included, included it in my volume. Even after that, I did not, it did not occur to me I might write a book about Taeyeon. Since I discovered him though, I simply could not stop talking about him. And uh, accordingly during my, um, I stopped thinking about him as a person and writer and all the work he wrote. So accordingly during my hallway and dinner table conversations with my friends and colleagues, I constantly brought him up. One day, one of my friends casually asked me, are you sure he's an article project? Just like that, it became my second project. Nak Chongjong was born in Jeonju, a city close to the current North Korean capital, Pyongyang. He emigrated to Hawaii with his extended family in only who moved with his wife, son, and two nephews to California in 1907 and spent the rest of his life there as a migratory manual worker. He died in 1953. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Asian migrant workers in the US were predominantly unmarried young men. But unlike them, Nak chung Jun was accompanied by his extended family. According to John's nephew, Jacob Chun, uh, Chun's actually uh, unpublished English language autobiography, the family's decision to move to the US was driven by the prospect of the war between Russia and Japan in 1904. That is known, of course, as the Japanese War. The family still remembered how the war between China and Japan devastated their hometown less than a decade earlier. Also, they knew the Korean government had no power to protect them. They figured it would be best to leave the country whose future had become unpredictable. In this sense, we might call Tian and his family war refugees. After working in sugar plantations in Hawaii for three years, Dr. Chang Jun moved to Riverside, California with his uh, wife, first son, Obed and two nephews, Frank and Jacob. Tell's wife, Ruth, gave birth to four more boys and two girls between 1907 and 1918. Then um, a, a year later, a year after she gave birth to the last one, she suffered from severe mental illness. She soon and passed away. Therefore, Nak chung Jun raised the seven children as a widow and single parent, working one job to the next in citrus farms, hotel kitchens, cafeterias, or rich people's households. His children had their own share of hardship as well. Among John's seven children, five younger ones grew up in, a, in an orphanage for some times, some years. None of, them, none of them were adopted away. They were sent to the orphanage for um, long-term overnight care. John retired from his work in the mid-1930s when he turned 60. He moved into a small retirement 
facility run by a Christian church minister. He lived with many other retired ethnic Korean male migrant workers who did not have, who never had opportunity to create their own family under the anti-racist misogynation law in California. According to John's uh, daughter, Ellen Chung, uh, who worked at one point as an editor-in-chief of the English edition of the San Francisco-based bilingual newspaper, Shinan Minbo. It was when and where Nak Chang Chan started dedicating himself to writing fiction and essays full time. You can access Ellen Chan and Ajik Chan's writing through uh, this wonderful uh, digital archive at uh, USC. It was also possible that some of his manuscripts had been missing or lost. And it looks like he didn't uh, get along with his sons too well, although he was close to uh, his two daughters, Ellen and Elizabeth, and he struggled with poverty all his life. John's life story was so dramatic and powerful, and I briefly thought about writing his biography. But ultimately I decided it should be a scholarly book about his writing, not about how he lived. The story to suggest that through his literature, he wanted to inspire broader audiences in the, US, um, in the US and beyond to think differently about the world, even though he could only write in a language that had almost no global presence then. I think he wanted to be remembered as a fiction writer rather than as an impoverished temporary manual migrant worker or victim of the system. Another reason I decided to write a literary criticism about his work rather than his biography is that none of John's stories are autobiographical in the strictest sense. Of course, he found sources of his story from his experience as a writer, as a worker, father, and avid reader. Nonetheless, he did not create a fictional character who resembled himself compared to his contemporary Korean American writer, Yang Gil Gang, whose two English language novels, The Grassroot and East Coast West, are told by the first person narrator, Song Pa Han. Song Pa Han, who undeniably personifies it's Kang himself. Tianzhu's story by contrast hardly give any clue to the socioeconomic background of the author. Tianzhu's story are far from about an ethnic Korean migrant worker's hardships in the US. On the contrary, they are filled with what we tend to associate with alluring middle or upper class modern culture in the 1920s and 30s. Juries, champagne, tourism, big band music, dance hall, Christmas party, airplanes, college education, lighthearted humor, radio, autom automobiles, and telephones. Three novels are set in Jeongju, his hometown in Korea. They focus on Hong kyung ne a legendary leader of the 19th century peasant uprising in Jeongju, and his fictive descendants that Dak chung jan made up. Chan's work that are set outside the Jeongju and the Korean Peninsula are all genre fiction. A Pitiful Grave, or which is actually a different version. It's the same, uh, he wrote similar versions, different versions of the same story. Also, there is another version set, A Grave of a Love Triangle. Uh, it's set in Shanghai and Nanjing in China. Mayflower, which is incomplete in LA, and Righteous Robber is in Wyoming in California. All three of them can be read as a romance fiction. A pitiful grave depicts an interracial love triangle between a British man who is completely fluent in Chinese as well as in English, a bilingual Chinese woman who studies in the US and Switzerland, and a Canadian woman who moved to Shanghai to help out her uncle's missionary work. I would put Mayflower into a romance subgenre, high school or teen romance, um, romance fiction. 
set in a non-segregated high school in LA. This is quite amazing. I thought before 1954, every school was segregated, but not in LA, it wasn't the case. Um, righteous or righteous robber mixes romance with gangster fiction. I would like to highlight the novelty and significance of the Chinese um, literature by using two concepts. Trans Pacific palimpsest and minor cosmopolitan literature. I call John a trans Pacific palimpsest to describe the unique aspect of his narrative. He blends aesthetic practices from both sides of the Pacific to envision a new egalitarian world while boldly challenging and revising the cultural and political norms of North, North America and those of East Asia. On the other hand, with minor cosmopolitan literature, I try to conceptualize what his literature text, literary text inspired to remember, imagine, that is solidarity beyond national and national border from a minor minority's perspective. In the case of a righteous robber, Tian revised gangster fiction, romance fiction, a pre-modern Korean romance novel, to engage with its contemporary American cultural politics, including prejudice against Asian and Asian, especially Asian masculinity, because they were mostly Asian men, and anti-misogynation law in California, the law designed to protect white women from racial minority men and to envision solidarity between white women and Asian men against white male superiority and capitalism. To support these points, I will go over this novella while focusing on the following four aspects. First, a righteous robber depicts an interracial woman defy California's anti misogynation law. Second, it shows a reverence for East Asian tradition. Three, it modifies pre code 1930s Hollywood gangster film. Four, it uses what I would tentatively call double consciousness, borrowing W.B. W.E.B. Du Bois concept. The Asian male character's double consciousness gives women choices and voices. And so this is a lot to take, but I will go over one by one. The first aspect, the righteous robber mainly revolves around the protest protagonist, Jack Lunds, in Fraser. Um, this is a manuscript. This is how it is written. It's yellow. Uh, <coughs> we, we still see in the, in, um, in the version. And he, he said the, the title itself is written in Chinese character, but the rest of them, rest of the text is written in Hunger. But Hunger, you know, very, very difficult to read, by the way. It's difficult to decipher because he uses um, century vocabulary expressions it's before Korea was it's Korean was standardized. The righteous robber mainly revolves around the protagonist projections into racial romance. These are the characters, characters' names, and you can follow, try to follow my story by looking at the names. Uh, also, these, all, these names are written in Korean, so it's my guess. It's my best guess. They might be different. Two white women, uh, Petty Young Love, Eva Hasling. Jim Chan is, um, is an ethnic Korean man in his early 20s. Ak chung Jun borrowed this name from his third son and fifth child, and probably in part created this character after him. Notably, Chun's bio, bi, biological son, Jack, turned 20 years old in 1934, when the author was likely writing this novella. Readers are told in the, in the opening scene that a week ago, Jack was uh, discharged from a Wyoming, Wyoming CCC camp, Wyoming-based CCC camp, or the Civilian Conservation Corp camp, which Franklin Roosevelt established as part of his New Deal legislation in 1933. He had just visited Mrs. Wilkinson in Riverside as he drove his car to Pnoma, Pamuna, when his high school friend, Eva Hasling, stops him. Eva is wait, waiting for a bus to return home after visiting her aunt. She asks him for a ride home, and he agrees, but not before politely 
getting her aunt's permission first. The, the relationship between them gradually evolves, evolves throughout the novella. The other love story between Jack and Patty appears as a story within the frame. When Eva and Jack arrive in Alhambra, a town close to LA, they enter a restaurant. There, Eva asks Jack if he has a, had a girlfriend. Jack tells her about his relationship with Patsy Youngdorf in Wyoming. Jack's love story with Patsy during his lifetime in CCC camp is told specifically in the first person, in the first person, in the first person, in the form of Jack's recollection of his past, as a past. Jack's relationship with the two women, the two women is not exactly a love triangle because Jack makes it clear, Patsy, Kudos to Patsy before leaving Wyoming that he would not pursue a romantic relationship with her, not because he does not find her attractive, but because after reading Patsy's essay she wrote when she was eighth grader, he came to conclusion, came to conclusion that Patsy would become a great politician, probably senator of Wyoming. We are talking about 1930s. Her marriage with a yellow person like him would hamper her future career. As such, Jack's relationship with the two white women are set against the backdrop of anti-misogynation law and widespread prejudice against interracial marriage and romance between white women and Asian men. There are other, a few striking aspects of Jack's romantic relationship. Women play a leading role in both relationships. They find him attractive before he shows his, his interest in them. They ask him to dance with him, ask him for a ride, try to move their relationship to another level. I find it particularly interesting that the other, uh, the, other the author constantly juxtaposes Jack with other white men, inviting readers to compare them. For example, Jack becomes friends with Patty at an outdoor independence party, dance party in Yellowstone, Wyoming, after he saves her from a white man's forceful attempt to make her dance with him. Uh, the man persists, insists that she is his lover, but Jack retorts, even if she is not your lover, but your wife, the only thing that matters is she said no. Uh, what do you randomly, why do you randomly use violence? Well, you fight with me. A man much more muscular and taller than Jack punches and gives him a nosebleed. Even though the crowd cheers for the white man and shouts, kill the Jack. Jack knocks him unconscious by striking, uh, striking him on his collarbone because that is the safety spot to attack within his reach without actually killing him. The man is taken to the hospital. Afterward, the Patsy introduced herself to Jack and asked him to dance with her. This episode presents Jack as a man with a strong sense of justice, a high moral caliber, and sophisticated street fighting skills. Another white man compared with Jack is Jack's friend from the camp, Harry Toussaint. Harry accompanies Jack to the dance party thanks to Jack's help. He spent that night dancing with his friend, Mary Cooley, who soon develops feelings for him. Harry is depicted as a good looking man with blue eyes, holy hair, light rose pink skin, and six feet high. While Jack captivates Patsy's heart, Harry fails to get Mary to like him. Despite Henry's, Harry's earnest romantic pursuit of her, Mary does not consider him more than a friend because in her own words, although Harry isn't as handsome as no one else, he's uneducated, not eloquent enough. Harry wasn't well-educated, having grown up in a poor family in the Oregon countryside. Jack is shorter and less handsome than Harry. Then what makes Jack more desirable than Harry? During his conversation with Eva, her brother Elmo and his wife Hassel, Jack shares his theory of how to seduce the opposite sex. 
It is to impress the, the other by showing that they excel in the area where the other where the other falls behind. Jack's secret weapon is intelligence, especially his mathematical. Which reminds me of the traditional East Asian romance uh, genre. The scholar in beauty fiction, where the male protagonist is always depicted as talented, and the female lead beautiful. Patsy and Eva struggle with math, and Jack develops a relationship with them while teaching them easy ways to solve the math problems. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not found a strong evidence that the all Asians are good in math narrative was available in California or in other parts of the US in the 1930s. According to the New York Times archive, this narrative started to emerge only in the mid 1980s. That is the children of those who moved to the US after the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 began taking standardized tests for college and admissions in large numbers. Of course, the, the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act, as many of you know, abolished the discriminatory immigration policy against Asians and Southern and East, Eastern Europe ethnic groups. And as a result, significantly increased the number of Asian immigrants in the US. In China's incomplete story, Mayflower, a prequel to a righteous robber, Jack refers to a Chinese math text from the Ming Dynasty as a source of his superior math skills. The skill in question is not particularly esoteric, but the same as what we, what is now globally known as the finite difference method. However, what seems to be significant in the context of this fiction is that first, Jack perceived the math skill as distinctively East Asian. The second, mastering that skill, his connection to East Asian roots makes him more desirable, attractive. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of Jack's character comparable to today's Asian male stereotype has to do with emotion. The two couples, Harry and Mary and Patsy and Jack, see the end of their relationship when the war department decided to move the Wyoming CCC camp to California because the snowstorms and cold waves that winter. At first, it appears that Harry and Jack react to the news quite the opposite way. Upon hearing the news, Harry loses consciousness. Other camp trainees make fun of him, make fun of him when he comes to himself. Jack defends Harry against other trainees' mockeries while trying to console him. Later that night, Jack finds Harry weeping while reading a star-crossed love story in a magazine. When Jack snatched the magazine away, Harry said, your heart must be made of cold stone or iron, Jack answers. Men must have a stony or iron-like heart so as not to be controlled by women. He continues to advise Harry not to show his emotions to Mary because it would make him unlikable to an outgoing person like Mary. However, Jack is not necessarily a man with a stony heart. Or in a more contemporary term, a so-called inscrutable Asian man. This part of the story is written in the first person, which allows the reader to have a more intimate look at Jack's complex interiority. After helping Harry sleep, Jack cannot fall asleep all night. And the next morning, finds his favorite breakfast, creamy corn soup, as bitter as malaria. The scene portrays Jack as capable of making emotional connections and being vulnerable. Nonetheless, Jack's interiority is much more complex than Harry's. Then the question is, why does Jack hide his emotions from other camp trainees and his best friend? Why does he? Why does he let others see him as an emotionless man, emotionless man? More precisely, why did the author first lead a reader to see Jack as an um, emotionless man before showing his vulnerability? Jack's emotional detachment is also repeated in his relationship with Eva. 
the story of which is told by anonymous third person narrator. Whereas Jack admits his emotional ties with Patsy only when he's left alone and shares it only with the reader in the form of a secret confession. Ebba's sharp-witted sister-in-law, Hassel, plays the role of the mind reader and explains Eva why Jack has not made any romantic advance to Eva. Jack is not blue-eyed like us, but a different race. If someone with a different skin color invites himself to your house, you will find him annoying and become unfriendly toward him. How can he start a relationship, <laughs> romantic relationship with you? So instead of chasing you, he expects you to chase him. He will follow you lead. To understand Hassel's explanation, I think it's useful to uh, see what W.E.B. Du Bois famous, du Bois famous uh, says in his soul, The Soul of Black Folk. Du Bois argues that an African-American man was, here I quote, born with a veil, gifted with a second sight in this American world. A word where, which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other word. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. This consciousness, this sense is a sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a word that looks on in amused contempt and unquote. Similarly, Jack's emotion is veil, leaving us forever wondering which one is his true self, the veil or what is underneath his veil. He always looks at himself or his emotion through the eyes of others, in this case, Emma. His feelings for her remain provisional and depend on whether or not she likes him back. We may as well see Jack's double conscience through the lens of transpacific palimpsest. Jack's private emotion is written over and he faces his exterior eye on her. We cannot avoid seeing one of them without noticing the other. Whether we call it double consciousness or transpacific polymphys, it is important to note that his doubleness invites women to assume an assertive voice and to claim ownership of their emotions. I have to add that in this novel, we are white women, not uh, women of color. But in Mayflower, Jack repeatedly emphasizes, admires the namesake black female character Mayflower's beauty. The third man compared with Jack is uh, Juan Capri. His distinctively Italian name, of course, it's a distinctively Italian name. Um, He's a haughty and uh, self-entitled womanizer from a rich and influential Capri family. He has several violent physical confrontations with Jack and is mis miserably uh, defeated each time. In an overwhelming manner, Jack is portrayed as a fearless, calm, strong, and a smart fighter. And John is quick-tempered, depraved, and tactless. We can find a connection between Jack and East Asian literary character again, uh, Yang So Yu. Um, a, a male protagonist of a well known pre modern Korean novel, A Nine Cloud Dream, he is not only a romantic hero, but also a superb role. You can see on the other side, on this side of the slide, he, he's pictured as a role. John loses his temper when visiting Eva to find her hanging out with Jack in her house. Even though only a few days ago, even though only a few days earlier, Eva caught him lying to her and going out to a dance hall with another woman. John provokes Jack with an anti-Asian slur. When Jack criticizes him for his lack of proper manners, John pulls out a gun to threaten him and Eva. Not afraid, Jack smiles and said, point a gun to my chest and shoot me if we are real men. John moves close to Jack and Jack knocks him down by kicking him 
you know, the knee. John drops his gun on the, on the floor, Jack picks it up and throws it to Eva, calling it the evidence of crime. Then he drags John outside, punching him in the, in the eyes, nose, and jaw until he can no longer resist and runs away. The love triangle between Jack, John, and Eva is the center of the last third of the novella. This part of um, this part is actually a gangster story, or more, more precisely, a fictional adaptation of a contemporary gangster film. I had so much fun learning about this genre and watching gangster films. <laughs> like Little Caesar, The Public Enemy, and Scarface, and like any other cinematic genre, gangster film has changed over time. Still, a few recognizable patterns exist among the so called classical gangster films in the early 1930s. According to film scholar Wilson Wan, Gangster film narratives originate from the headlines, topical events, and true crime narratives of newspapers and tabloid publications. During the Prohibition era between 1920 and 1933, the national banning of the sales of alcohol in, the, in 1920 led bootlegging to thrive and organized crime to grow exponentially. The stories about organized crimes were <laughs> headlines during this time, and newspapers were often criticized for giving gangster too much publicity and for glorifying cr criminals as heroes. One of the most famous one was Al Capone, a gang leader in Chicago. According to Nick Roddick, the film uh, studios like Warner Brothers found its genre profitable during the depression during the depression, not because it was inexpensive, not only because it was inexpensive to make, but also its focus on contemporary social problems attracted their targeted working class audiences. A pioneer of the studies of this genre, Robert Warshow, called Gangsters, a gangster film, uh, a gangster in gangster film, a tragic hero of Americanism. The typical narrative arc of this genre is gangster's gradual upward mobility and success followed by his quick demise and often his death. I would argue that Nak Chung Jun's fictional adaptation of the classical Hollywood gangster challenges these basic premises of the genre. The story is set after the national banning on alcohol sales was lifted which suggests that this, this story, it was uh, the story, stories were, his stories managed to were all undated, but we can tell the story was written after December 5, 1933. Still, alcohol is an important narrative prop, like many other gangster films from the early 1930s. But John modifies the gangster genre in a, in a few significant ways. The one who breaks the law on alcohol is not Jack. It's not a male character, but Eva. Eva is arrested for drinking and driving and put in a county jail. Although she was, she only had one glass of wine. Isn't that <laughs> it was John Capri who invited her to drink and a secretly placed the bottle in her car to revenge on her. The streetcar driver was as responsible as ever, uh, if not more, because she was, he was driving the streetcar to the west when the bell instructed him to go. <coughs> Still, Eva is sentenced to pay $250,000, $250,000 in the 1950s as a fine and serve 30 years, or otherwise she had to serve 30 years in prison. Jack gambled to make quick money, but it didn't work out. <laughs> so he organized a makeshift gang with his friends, Stuart and Henry, and his younger brothers, Thomas and Esau. Both are actually real life Nak Chung Jun's sons, and robs the bank. In the process of planning, the goal of bank robbery becomes more explicitly critical. His younger brother, Umas, 
Jack's younger brother, Umas, says, he joins the gang to defy newspaper editor's recent comment that Orientals do not commit robbery or theft only because they are not brave enough. He joins the gang to show that Orientals are, are brave enough but won't commit crimes because they are just too ethical. The gang robs the bank, but it is a bloodless robbery with a greater cause. Instead of stealing money from the safe and running away, Jack pressured, pressures the head of the bank to sign a paper to donate $500,000 to jobless people. <laughs> he spends half of the money to save Eva and distribute, distributes the rest to unemployed people in the city of LA. Unlike Al Capone, Jack's story makes the newspaper headline the next morning. It says, the newspaper article says, the gun used for the robbery was actually a toy, toy machine gun. <laughs> this way, Jack John's gangster story does not end with the main protagonist demise. Uh, John offers an alternative image of Asian masculinity by complicating, on the one hand, the existing cultural script of a working class Asian man, whether good or bad, such as iron-hearted, sexually undesirable, hardworking, cowardly, ethical, traditional bound, and on the other, partially adopting the troubled yet glamorous image of white masculinity presented in gangster films, which is individualistic and success-driven. As I pointed out at the beginning of this talk, this novella was never published during the author's lifetime, therefore remains unedited and unpolished. I actually gave a talk to, uh, to authoritative figures uh, in Korean studies in Korea through the Jew. And uh, the most authoritative person actually said, this is not a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you work on that? You should work on something else. I'm trying to make my case here. <laughs> um, it is an American story written in the Korean language which makes it impossible to place it within Korean literature or American literature. No matter how messy it may look, this work is extremely important, not the least because it carries out an important task of undoing white manhood in the 1930s. I haven't encountered such a direct challenge against white masculinity in modern Korean literature or Asian American literature of this time. White masculinity is often considered a universal norm of manhood. By questioning this universally, uh, universality of manhood, the answered novella, Righteous Robber, brings out two unexpected outcomes, criticizing capitalism and empowering women. By doing so, it gestures toward cross-racial solidarity among the powerless, which I would call minor cosmopolitanism. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Yang, for that very uh, thought-provoking talk. I honestly, I <laughs> did not know what to expect, and I never thought I could hold so many different strands uh, together. Um, if uh, if your colleagues in Korean literature do not think that's, in, in, I think you can sell this right, as, a, as, a, as a script for some kind of show. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for the Q and A portion of tonight's event, I will now invite a colleague, Professor Eun Sung Kim, to serve as moderator. She will kick off the conversation with a question or two and then field a question from the audience for our speaker. Um, I will also note right now that everyone who registered for this event has been entered into a raffle for a copy of Professor Yang's book. After the Q&A, we will announce the winners and invite them um, to the front for a photo with Professor Yang. For now, let me just quickly introduce <laughs> Professor Kim. So Professor Unsung Kim is Associate Professor of English here at Northeastern University. She's a specialist of poetry and her work centers on critiques of colonialism and racial capitalism um, and draws from critical digital studies, translation studies, critical theory, and critical race and ethnic studies. Professor Kim is the recipient of a Ford Foundation Fellowship, a grant from the Andy Warhol Arts Writers Program, and Yale University's Pointer Fellowships. Um, her writings have appeared in numerous anthologies and publications, and her book, The Politics of Collecting, 
Race and the Aestheticization of Property, will be published by Duke University Press in 2024. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kim to the conversation. Are we sitting here? Yeah. Thank you, Philip, for your warm introduction. And thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to begin by discussing or just asking you um, a little bit more about the, uh, the ways in which the manuscript was donated to USC and uh, a little bit about like perhaps the author's um, plans for editing or publishing mm -hmm. or ambitions. Were there other manuscripts donated perhaps with the short stories like journals or letters? Mm -hmm. So the, it's, a, it's a good question. Thank you so much. And thanks, for, thanks for actually joining me. Uh, oh, conversation. It's fascinating talk. I, 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 I probably have many questions for you. I know I was writing things down. Yeah. And oh, it's uh, uh, the, the, the story is that uh, his manuscripts were uh, preserved in a leather suitcase. So that's why. So I thought, oh, yeah, we should put our manuscripts secretly in leather. <laughs> <laughs> so that it won't be lost, right? So that's how it was. Uh, it wasn't uh, discarded for a long time, and I think um, it's, a, it's exactly don't know. That's there's a lot of story we need to actually unearth uh, in the process of uh, putting together my mon monograph. And uh, there are other people who are working on this manuscript, um, but. The, the family tried to translate, get it translated, and actually they spent a lot of money. The, but the, trend, the quality of the translation wasn't really good. I hope the translator is not listening to me, but I don't know where he is exactly, but it wasn't really good. But, but I think the family, so it's, it's interesting because the, his sons, uh, so uh, they, they Give money. They put together money, large sum of money, and each time they, each time they, they won batch of trends and came out. They read it. Uh, so that was one one idea. But donation was made uh, by a Sam Chun's adopted daughter. She was adopted from Korea before the Korean War. That's quite an interesting story. She was very enthusiastic about the preserving the family legacy. And she was the one who organized all the money, money, you know, the, the getting the money from from uh, the uncles and and aunts and so forth. But that's the story. But it's a, you can actually read more about it from the digital yeah. archive. Yeah. So, like, his family was supportive of his writing. Not, I, I'm not sure. Or, yeah. See, this is this is what happens if that the person died. Many decades ago, we don't know, nobody studied it before. So I have a lot of question marks, a lot of questions then I can answer. But um, they, it looks like he was, uh, that Bak Chang John locked himself in a room and writing rather than spending time with the children. So children resented him that. I think that's the story I've heard. It's like fascinating because there's like stories of particularly like John Okada's wife um, trying to donate the second manuscript to UCLA and mm -hmm. UCLA like telling her to like just burn it or like throw it away. And so I'm like fascinated that like there was a donation and then it was accepted, but also it seems like like almost they knew their father was writing and they read their father's writing, which um, corresponds to your sort of telling us that the names were his sons. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Also, I think I want to emphasize how important it is to, to have a great talented librarian. So there's one librarian at the USC East Asian Library. He now retires, but he's just sort of working together with us. <laughs> also means Son Young Park and some other people from Korea. And uh, he hold, he held on to this without knowing what it is. He sort of had a hunch that it might be really important, but who knows, right? And it's not until I started to read and some other people started to read in 2018, nobody knew it's how valuable those stories are. So it's a, actually, we have to give the librarian a huge credit. 
Um, there's many institutional actors. I have like some more questions, but I also want to take questions from the audience. Um, I was like thinking as you were discussing Tun's work and like the politics, the subtle politics and like the romance of the work, it reminded me a lot of like your book's discussion of the ways in which individual, the, the idea or notions of individualism becomes enacted through the work of translation right, right. in early colonial Korean fiction. And I was hoping you could discuss the, the ways in which perhaps like Chun's work speaks to the, the work that you analyze more, oh, that's or, a, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, or, or how it perhaps like pushes some of notions of individualism. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that was actually another talk I gave. To, I have, half the time I talked about my monograph and half the, the other half is well because there's a connection. Uh, another story that I briefly mentioned is uh, Pitiful Queen. There are three men, three three figures, three characters who are uh, romantically entangled, and in the end, uh, they got married. So the Chinese woman and uh, the British man who fluently speak uh, Chinese, <coughs> they got married. But this pattern was um, it's very unusual because in Hollywood film in the 1920s and 30s, there were films, some films about interracial romance and marriage, but always one of them died. <laughs> so, but in this case, uh, <coughs> they all died too. <laughs> Wait a minute, people, please. Because they died but after married. They got married and also they said, I will bury, uh, the, first of all, the Canadian woman committed suicide because she was so humiliated. And, after that, uh, oh, by the way, they have the same name. One is Ruby, the other one is Kangju. Kangju is Chinese translation of Ruby. So, oh, it's Canadian Kangju committed suicide. I can't live. So she committed suicide, asking that she should be buried with her. And uh, also the man, the bridge man, he's, he also killed himself, said, I will bury with him. So, but uh, what I said in my book is that in Korea, translating individual was a very difficult task because it, the concept didn't exist. Concept didn't, didn't exist. But so first people, first group of writers who started to translate, they translate it <coughs> as, um, uh, in a strange way. They, uh, into, uh, they create an individual character, but Always the individual characters are women, <coughs> especially wife, uh, mother, mother is less, but usually wife or uh, daughter. <coughs> so this is a quite interesting thing because these women declare or claim their individuality only by, uh, by trying to recreate their family. So in a way, they, they don't exist. They seem to assume they exist. They never exist by themselves, I'm always with a family. But I change and my individuality is, which is actually becoming more um, a freedom <coughs> seeker, becoming a freedom seeker, uh, have the, some rights or have some human rights, claiming human rights. It has to do with in connection with in connection with the family. So I create new home with my husband. So I will be a, a modern wife. That's how I become individual. That's how I become uh, the owner of rights, human rights. So that's a very peculiar type of individuality. But it has, the, the, the pitiful grave has that aspect too. They always find uh, try to find partners or romantic partners that has to do that actually conforming their freedom, right? Expanding their freedom by relating to others rather than I'm already a person before I meet you. Okay. I'm becoming someone else by being associated with you. That's the theme. So I thought that connection is there. Dr. Chung John actually moved to the United States before this genre fiction, the, uh, the domestic novel flourished. But I found out that a, a lot of books were imported to the US. There was a bookstore, the Korean, bookstore, Korean language bookstore 
in LA. So also he was associated with this uh, group created by uh, patriarch, uh, patriotic um, leader of independent movement, An Chang Ho in Patapak camp in Riverside. So he was with the group for, he lived with the group for a while. So I'm, I'm pretty sure this group read evidently the Korean books imported from Korea to the US and they shared the book. That's pretty, I'm 95% certain about that. So also only a question about editing and so yeah. this is also, I'm saying that I can't answer the question, but I will disappoint you. But it's, the, we don't know why he didn't publish his works. One is that one of the, but one, one curious fact is that his daughter, uh, his second daughter, Ellen Chan, worked for Sinan Minbo. So if we wanted it, I think he, it would have been pretty easy for him to publish his works. Uh, but if we consider the pre-modern literary practices, there's no publication. So only after one dies, they publish their work, their lifetime work and circulate them among, friends, among family. So it is possible he was just rather thinking about that as a model rather than rather than modern publication. So he is very, very strangely pre-modern and modern and beyond modern at the same time. Maybe I'll ask one more question and then we can take a few. Um, I was really intrigued by the ways in which you wove um, Du Bois's double consciousness, um, something that he's like writing and thinking towards like in particular, and then your reference to Mayflower. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you can speak a little bit more about perhaps Chun's like um, like the ways in which like non-white characters as a whole sort of interacted in his fiction. Oh, that's a big question. That's a good one too. Oh, uh, somehow like for example, the Chinese woman in beautiful grave. She is extremely smart and uh, fashionable, <laughs> um, very extremely attractive at the same time. And she actually leads the relationship too. So that's with her relationship, in her relationship with a white man. So it is, it is very purposeful in a way, like purposefully created character who is, uh, not really trying to overshadow, but rather uh, I'm as good as you. That's the message I get, I'm getting from his non-white characters. And like, to, to, were there interactions between them as well? Like you were saying Mayflower being like a black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that, those, those three, I, I wish I could read the whole thing. It's end before anything really okay. happened. <laughs> He's pursuing a white girl, by the way. But he mentions constantly Mayflower, and also it's titled May Mayflower. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what happened, what was meant to happen, right? Do we have questions from the audience? Um, thank you for, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I teach Japanese history here. Um, my question actually, I think, follows up with this issue of uh, sort of various non-white characters. Um, you mentioned early on that there's a scene, I think they're in Wyoming, where Jack is called a Jap. Um, it did make me wonder kind of about the sort of colonial context in Korea. I mean, obviously he's left before uh, Korea becomes part of the Japanese empire, but I'm wondering if you see sort of the narrative that he's pitching, not only as kind of his identity as a Korean American person against sort of white society, mm -hmm. but also any interplay with kind of Japanese imperialism back home in Korea. Um, and whether you see kind of interactions with Japanese American or the Japanese community in LA mm. um, playing out at all in his fiction, or if you know anything about his family or the community he was in and whether there was um, any sort of entanglements there. He, uh, he wrote several essays mm -hmm. and he's very into independent movement too. And he also um, contributed to Shinan Minbo a small, very small um, message. And he said, uh, right after um, Korea 
became the protectorate of Japan, he said, he sent a message to the Shinamimbo and said, um, I, like, we, I know that we are trying to create a democratic society. Do you think you will be, you will remain democratic after we got the power back from Japan or something like that? So he's into Jap Japanese, um, that he's into independent movement for sure. But I don't remember talk, him talking negatively about Japan or critical about Japanese per se. It's quite peculiar come to think about it. Thank you for the question. But um, also um, there are a lot of short stories or some novellas serialized in Shinambi book. <clears throat> and I tried to read them all, read them all. The basic, I need to go back to that too, but my impression is that a lot of people who contributed to Shinaminbo didn't think that they are living in the United States. They act like they are still living in the Korean Peninsula. So very anti-Japanese, they are into this ret rhetoric from, from their home country, they adopted it. But, so it's, it, his works stand out that way. Other questions, Patricia? Yeah, um, well, just kind of about your point regarding the colleague that talked about how the work is, um, and, and as a, it's a translated work at the time, Korean wouldn't be, be that influential. And also, it um, it wasn't published, obviously, but it definitely has more than historical value, like as an artistic work. Um, and obviously, you've dedicated quite a bit of, of your career to it. So just kind of the implications of that in academia and how that's valued, how different works are valued. Oh, I, I found it, I think there is a literary value. So I'm trying really hard to make my point clear, make my case, because we are talking about really badly written work yeah. from one perspective, right? from one perspective. It can be really bad badly written work, but I see a treasure in it. What, I, what should I do? <laughs> so that's my conundrum. I want to, uh, so this, there are several um, solutions for that. I asked my uh, filmmaker friend uh, to make a movie about it and using the text. And the second one is I also thought the filmmaker friend is also writing novels too. So I asked him if he's, whether he, he's interested in rewriting his stuff, uh, preserving the essence, at least what I think essence, his essence, right? So essence, is it possible? I wonder. So I don't want this to be forgotten. That's what I think my point is because it's, uh, it's fascinating. It is something very pr provocative and we can easily find even in contemporary literature. So that's, that's what, I, what I'm trying to do. I, I want to call it, is it okay yeah. to call it a thin poet's perspective? No, I, need a no, perspective. I, I, think, I think part of also like what the question is prompting and let me know if, um, if this is the direction, but like, I guess, could you discuss like what you see are like the structures of literary merit and like how merit is decided and perhaps how scholars are involved, like mm. arguing for merit. Like why did this colleague? Oh, know, why he? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The question was like, what, like what, what, what is the standard that the colleague is sort of measuring? The colleague, my colleague. Uh, so I think her perspective, I hope she's not listening. <laughs> she's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, I think she is looking at me as one of the few uh, literary scholar specialists in the US. The Korean, Korean literary, so specialist in Korean literature. So we know that there aren't many people right, who are doing that. So she said, why are you wasting your time doing something so ugly, right? So that's her point. So, but it's, 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 I was curious because she wrote books about only 20th century literature. I think I can identify the merits easily because I worked on the domestic novel. Mm. Domestic novels are not relevant, but I found them fascinating. Well, you see the politics. 
that are in the domestic novel and the ways in which the domestic novel bypass censorship mm. by using this kind of aesthetics to really think through uh, both the position against oh, you, You've re read re really closely. <laughs> I read your book. <laughs> I'm not up here. Like, I listened to the podcast too. It's a good book, everyone. <laughs> yeah, so I think that there's a way in which like, you see the ways in which the writer is not just thinking about expression as a as a as like untethered to cultural expectations mm -hmm. but like all of the material infrastructures mm -hmm. that go into certain decisions other questions it's not really a question but just a comment about the resonances about this image of the suitcase and the way you know the the accident of preservation, which is not really an accident. I'm thinking of um, the Indonesian writers in exile who, after 1965 and the genocide, were kind of dispersed all over Europe, right, mm -hmm. or all over the world, really, China, Cuba, the Netherlands, Russia, all over. And there was one particular guy who was a journalist and a writer, and they all kind of lived through poverty. Um, but one of his um, his legacies, I suppose, you know, the, the objects he held on to was a suitcase oh. filled of his writing. And oh. I think it's so similar in that, you know, That's fascinating. Um, what, what people who were politicized and who were exiled away from the homeland valued and how they would perhaps compartmentalize them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and his daughter kept that suitcase and kind of showed others, but it's exactly the kinds of things that are out of circulation, that are preserved, that people have not yet gotten to. So I'm really excited by your new work because it tells us that there's still so much to discover, right? Yeah, I have kind of very special sort of autonomous imaginations mm -hmm. that don't seem tethered to any national tradition. Right. I, I, because a lot of, a lot of true stories serialized in the Shinamin San Francisco based Korean language newspaper. It's not very nationalistic, really. And also another one that is another aspect that I found problematic is that they internalize the white supremacy mm. so excessively. So they don't appreciate themselves. I thought it was, wow, amazing. So, but somehow I don't see that level of um, inferiority complex in Chan's work. If anything, he is overcoming it in a way. I wonder, uh, in part, I think it has to do with the narrator he adapted, especially not this work particularly, but a pitiful grave. He adapted the narrator that was very popularly used in the domestic novel. That domestic novel was published uh, during the time when uh, reformist, the Korean reformist, started to embrace vernacular literature. So the reformist had this tremendous authority and power within the narrative as a narrator. So they said, this is not God. This is not a uh, civilized activity. You have to behave like this. You have to educate women. That's it. That's it, there is no question should be asked. But that type of extreme radical authority preserved in his work because he's, he wrote in the style of the domestic novel in part. There was one theory that I had, but with a righteous robber, it's more genre fiction. It's much more, much, much more Americanized than a pitiful grave. Maybe it's because it was set in the US, LA, California, but the other was set in Shanghai, although it's just Shanghai in 1920s. It has to do with, so I don't want to uh, put him on a pedestal and admire him. I sort of do that. <laughs> I like him a lot, I'm haunted by him. Like I, I, I like at the beginning, I, I said, I, I'll just advocate his work. It's just so, so, so painful to think about I have this image, him in a room, empty room with a very small desk in the facility, <clears throat> the retirement facility made by uh, the church minister. 
I don't think that was very fancy apartment, right? So he was writing his work. That's the image that I have. Like I have much more, but you know how how better I, writer I am, right? So that's that's kind of thing that that driven me. But as a scholar, <laughs> I trying to try not to have like use my enthusiasm <laughs> on my writing too much. I'm trying to be trying to be a little bit, little bit detached. I think it has to do with the style and mode. A little bit about him too, because he's not consistent. If it's a polished and edited work, it would restore some consistency, but he's not coherent. But like polished and ed edited means like one goes through an editor. And so I think like that that's a, a kind of process that he just wasn't alive for. Mm -hmm. But like the image that Doreen is invoking, it also, when you were discussing like him, I was thinking of like some like Jean Pancier's book, like Knights of Labor, where he's like looking through workers' archives and mm -hmm. like seeing like, um, the ways in which like they have short stories and like fiction and, and thinking about like how the political desires perhaps can be read through all of the ways in which they took time to like make things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think there's like a, a lot to be excited Thank about. You. Thank yeah. you. So he's not very tall. So he was uh, a <laughs> dishwasher. He had to like tiptoe or put like, there was some 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 things up under under him. He was doing like this. That's Ellen John's um, witness account. So that's the image that I have. And, like, he was raising multiple children. I'm raising only one. I'm complaining. About. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's seven children and a widow. So like I have a tremendous a lot of sympathy for him as a person. So that's why I can't write his biography. I can't be an objective writer. But it's a, it's a story I can be a little like step back and think about his work. Anyways, other questions? Yes. Hi, um, I remember how you stated that a lot of the 19th century Korean vocabulary I used was like specific to the time period. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask a little more on how the translation process works in regard to the specific connotations and how you expand on those within my own. Wow, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, a lot of vocabulary. Um, so there are uh, Hwang Jae-moon in, in Korea He's uh, affiliated with the Kyuzang uh, Institute in Seoul National University. He made modernized the version. He did a wonderful job, but it's it's very very challenging work. I I give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, some of the challenges are um, the transliteration of English. That's very unpredictable. And for example, um, Ruby, Ruby is is written in Uruby, Uruby, Uruby in Korean, and uh, because that's how they spelled. As it turns out, in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of Koreans just spelled R because R is doesn't exist in Korean, so they added Wu. I don't know, like if you to convince him or not. It makes sense to me, but <laughs> it's Ruby then. Okay, that so Uraki, Uruby, or that that is one example. Translation is being uh, done by um, a professor at Yale University, Kyunghee Oh, oh Kyunghee. She just started her position. I'm very happy about that. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful writer at, as well as a translator. So she is translating some of his works. And I've been working, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the issue of translation a lot. And one question I have is, should I, um, or should she edit it or not? Because I bet if we translate, if she translated and publish it, people said, oh, wow, what a trash. <laughs> like how do I make it uh, readable, reachable? Like I see a uh, great value in it, but uh, I I found a value in a like a trash can. I'm sorry, like <laughs> I shouldn't call it trash can. 
if I like make extreme analogy or something like that. It's not, it doesn't look pretty outside immediately. Sometimes I have a hard time reading through the story. I do, I do, I, when I do that, but once I do that, I'm extremely satisfied with the work. So this is another work that, you know, like how, how do I do that? So I hope that um, it, it's, a, it's a collaborative project. Definitely. I think I'm, I'm trying to invite, if you want, if you are interested in participating in the project, let me know. We need more people, like a film project or drama. And what he said, what he said in his uh, unpolished form should be, uh, should see the light of day. In contemporary America, I think that's what I believe for some reason. Maybe one or two more questions. Wait, wait, yes. Yeah. I ask a question here. Yeah. Um, so uh, you just mentioned that uh, most of his work are unpublished, um, but it's written in Korea. So if you can give an estimation. But what do you think that he is trying to locate his audience like? Um, who do you think that he is actually writing these stories to? Like, who do oh, that's a great that, question. Um, that yeah. somebody's gonna read, who's gonna read his uh, story. I love the question. So I have a theory. I have a theory that he intended English-speaking audience. Isn't that crazy? Is it crazy? That's my claim in my article. It's a, I think he's a Don Quixote character, Kijori character, on himself. He wanted to talk to um, English speaking Americans, actually, the mainstream Americans. At one point in one of his essays, he said, only if I knew how to write in English. No, he couldn't. He couldn't learn how, to, he didn't have time, money to do that. So, I think it's uh, his intended audience. Though I have, um, because it's uh, if it's an intended audience of Korean, he probably definitely talked about anti-Japanese or anti-imperialism or something, right? But he didn't write about that. That's one one of the clues. And he wrote about um, what's going on in America. What bothers um, racial minorities? especially Asian men. His intended audience might have included some other Asian ethnic uh, workers and leaders, I think. What I'm pretty sure about is he didn't intend to write for Koreans, at least Koreans in the Korean Peninsula. Thank you for the question. Well, my question is mostly about this um, who has, um, you know, um, right to write in a sense of who can be a writer, who can have, uh, whom do we um, respect as a, as a writer? And so he might not fit into those descriptions who can be a writer, but he was a writer. Mm -hmm. And that is a question of audience. Like, do you have an audience for your writing? But it's, it is really that creativity uh, that comes from people having this internal life and we don't know about them because who, how many other people might be thinking or writing, but we never get to know them. And so mm -hmm. the question is, you know, it, it's always what's the document, what's what's known and what's not known. Mm -hmm. And I think by you discovering that and talking about, you talk about these people who existed, have this very rich life, which, which was not really known mm -hmm. to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about when you're talking about Van Gogh. When he was, you know, nobody liked his paintings and it was his total disaster. And somebody asked him, like, what, whom are you painting for? And he says, well, the people I painted for do not exist. They, they're not, no, excuse me, they're not born yet. No, he said, they're not born yet. And I think it is this kind of question that sometimes takes time for the audience to kind of recognize some of the work. I like that a lot. Who has the right to write? And it is, so this is one thing that I found while writing my first monograph, and um, one is that, actually before that, not before I finished the monograph, and I so, somehow I read a lot, and one point I realized that, hmm, why does the narrator sound the same? 
or authors, please. They all sound like uh, well-educated South Korean men or Korean men. So it's, or even women, when women, some of the women write, they sound like men, elite men. So I, that's very institutionally, that was, that, that has been established that, that practice came into being through the institutionalization. In order to become a writer, you have to be recommended by existing writers, right? And that could be your professor. <coughs> and, or there was a, it's, it's called um, Bundan in, in Japanese, the same like Bundan. <coughs> it's a very weird being. There was a group it's a fixed group, but in order to go into this group, it's a writer's group, basically. It's not, you're not joining the member, you know, membership by paying the paying membership fee, but somehow you have to recognize by other writers, existing well-known reputed writers. Somehow, uh, but those writers usually have college degrees and they know each other pretty well. They have a very closed group. It's amazing. They know each other like, completely. The, the field is the Mundan in Korean, Korean Mundan, very close up group. He's a from, he never went to college, by the way. He didn't have, he didn't go to college in Japan. That was a practice. So in 1910s and 1920s, those who went to college, there was no college in Korea until 1920s, mid 1920s. So, Families, well-to-do families, they send their children to Japan to educate, college education. They came back, they became the power, literary power and cultural power. But he is now what, he's a, he's a migrant worker. Nobody would take him seriously. So one, I'm <coughs> just struggling. Is it external pressure like that made him decided not to publish his works, or it's just, um, just he didn't care, nobody knows. I can only answer, it's just a prediction. So you can you can predict, you can guess, but I don't think you can find a final, final answer to that question. Thank you so much, it's a beautiful question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, oh, that that? for that very uh, stimulating conversation and for taking the questions from the audience. Uh, now we are going to move to the um, to the book raffle portion of our event. So, uh, Jin Yao, would you like to announce the three winners, please? And then we'll invite the winners to please come up and then uh, claim their book. Please take a photo with Professor Yao. And I just announced my favorite one. Yeah, go ahead. Winner is. <laughs> Winner is R, sorry. Winner is Ashley Freeman. Ashley Freeman, yay. <laughs> <laughs> the second winner is Teresa. <laughs> Now, would you please like to stand right next to them and then we'll take a go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the screen will be Congrats. We're going to do it in front of um, this. So we're going to kind of try to. Oh, oh you're just going to put that in a different. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. You want to take a couple steps out, please? Excellent. And then, yeah, I want to be able to see the books if you don't mind. 
And um, thank you so much. Before we, conclude, before we conclude the event, um, I just want to make an announcement that the next uh, speaker series, uh, the next speaker in the series will be held on October 18th on a Wednesday. Uh, Professor uh, Ha Jin Jun uh, will be here to give a, she's a historian and she, I forgot her the, the title of her talk, but she's yeah. going to be looking at mortality and that. religion. Um, I was also going to mention that we have plenty of food, um, so please take some food with you. And for those of my students, um, the sign in sheet is in the front. So thank you very much. Thank you. I have to say, I also other writers. Um, <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's simmering. It's simmering. I think you uh, showed up. No, you were. The rest of her yeah. life. Yeah. I mean, this is nice. The papers are ideas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how are you? This is my student. Hi, uh, oh, hi. Nice nice how are you? Yeah, yeah. that's the theme. Well, that's you the theme. Uh, I like how does Violet uh, just like, is that an accurate representation of okay. okay. another one? Like, I also like yeah, yeah. 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 not necessarily. Yeah, just... much. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a podcast? Yeah, you want to like, on a podcast? She was on a podcast. Uh, yeah, this is a regular. Right. <laughs> right. right. Doreen did such a good job. Doreen's very, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. No, no, I only did a lot of the Oh, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. No, it's for everyone. Oh, it's for everyone. How's your semester been? Thank you so much. Thank you for taking a sandwich, too. Thank you for taking a sandwich. You're doing us a favor. Beginning of the semester, I feel like we were just kind of like compression mode, but then I feel like by the no, I remember him. Do people know you're here? Like, I'm accepting stuff. So I was like, I'll try to go and realize like, it's so freaking happening. Oh my god. No. I want to try to organize the duration of it, but I'm wondering if Awesome, but on my to do list. Those are the things to do. You and I think I'm like the thing I'm gathering. Oh, I know it. Yeah, I hope there's also a great idea. Oh, really? 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 Okay, I'll make sure. Oh, okay. Now you have a large 
kind of a given. Okay. I'll get. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna ask her. Maybe we should ask her. Okay. So, 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 what is your name? Keeping it. Angela. Okay, yes. Thank you so much. I'm a professor here. I know. Oh, you're not. Which is Oh, so it's recording is still on. It's a good event for a study of one of Yeah. Yeah. Really? 